Hello and welcome to the debate. I'm your host, Sana Makbul, with you at BTV World. In today's show, we're going to be taking a look at two important stories. Uh, the first is in reference to what has been going on in the country regarding the current economic situation. And this is extremely important in light of getting bilateral engagements and foreign investment within the country as well. And so in the spirit, uh, the Prime Minister's visit to the Middle East and Gulf states is going to be an important one. He's embarked on a journey where he will be going to multiple countries. He's just landed in the UAE and he's going to be moving from there to Kuwait and then to Dubai. And all of these engagements are going to be centered around key relationships regarding economy and various sectors where trade and investment partnerships can further collaborate and develop. This is important, especially given the current circumstances and the end of the first IMF review and what, of course, lies ahead for Pakistan in terms of making sure that the trajectory that it's going on uh, is maintained and that we uh, bring forth more money within the country, especially after the confidence that has been regained again by the first review of the IMF. And so moving forward with an approach where we take in more of what has been a uh, part of the journey in terms of running engagements with other countries and see what can actually come about. So it will be a big question mark in terms of what exactly will be achieved and how beneficial will be the various number of uh, agreements that are planned to be signed between the leadership of both the countries, um, various other, of course, aspects to the trip as well, including uh, the participation in the COP28 summit in Dubai, in which, of course, a number of engagements are going to be part of the discussion, especially with regard to climate-induced disasters and climate change that is Pakistan's uh, number one problem when it comes to disasters and what it the kind of impact that, that has on the economy so that's going to be an important discussion as well in terms of what is going on and we're going to be taking a look at what this means in terms of the many many engagements that are part of the Prime Minister's trip in our second segment we'll also be taking a look at an unfortunate incident in which two civilians have been killed and three soldiers have been martyred among 10 injured um, in a suicide attack um, on an army convoy in Banu area of Khyber Pakhtunkhwa and uh, this is um, uh, an increase in, 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 in the many a number of attacks that we've seen not just in terms of recent months but also in recent days with a number of other attacks also um, uh, being uh, uh, conducted within this week and intelligence operations also being conducted by the security personnel. The suicide bomber um, uh, was uh, claimed to uh, be an Afghan national and uh, there's a lot of investigation going on in terms of uh, sanitizing the area of any sort of terrorist existence and moving forward um, with a more firmer resolve to deal with terrorist activities, particularly in the provinces of KP and Balochistan that have suffered the most and have seen an increase of attacks, um, especially since the end of the ceasefire between Tariqa Taliban, Pakistan and the government. So what lies ahead in the wake of such activities and what is going to be the future strategy, especially in terms of the decision taken um, by the government and uh, military leadership with regards to Afghan nationals is also going to be important in terms of the dynamic that is impacting the country today. So that's going to be our focus at the end of the show as well. For this and more, as always, uh, we've been joined by senior analyst Baru Qaddafi and Raja Faisal in the studios. And for our first segment, we've been joined by Dr. Jamil Ahmed Khan, who's a former ambassador. He's joined us online. Thank you very much, Dr. Jamil, for being part of the discussion and joining us um, in the debate. Um, when we take a look at what is going on, of course, in terms of the many, many aspects uh, to economic relations, uh, it's important that we understand what is really going on and what really will be the benefit of the engagement that we see so far. Um, and Farouk, when we take a look at, at what mm -hmm. engagements the Prime Minister has planned, especially in terms of the countries that are involved, uh, UAE, Kuwait and Dubai, um, what, what is our hope in terms of these engagements and what sort of aspects will be very important in light of the various number of agreements and given the fact that we, ha we, have, we are going to have this engagement after the first review of the IMF has been completed. You're right, uh, Sana. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity and welcome back. <coughs> Regarding you. the importance of this visit, of course, uh, now we are not talking about hopes only, <coughs> we are talking in terms of practical steps, right? Uh, for instance, this visit uh, to Abu Dhabi first and then, of course, to Kuwait uh, is supposed to have or expected to have uh, a, um, uh, you know, a lot of MOUs uh, being signed. And uh, we know that uh, because uh, and the sect sectors that are uh, being discussed are very important. Let me read uh, some of those names or titles. Investment cooperation, energy, uh, port management uh, and shipping, of course, uh, uh, waste management, 
then uh, food security, logistics, mining, aviation, banking, and finance uh, services. So there is going to be incredible cooperation. We already know that Pakistan is in talks with, uh, um, uh, you know, UAE regarding uh, offloading certain of our, uh, you know, public sector or SOE, uh, you know, uh, assets. So there is going to be some cooperation, and I think that this is going to be the build up for the. Uh, future cooperation in the coming days. Similarly, Kuwait also is very important stakeholder, very important partner. So we are going to actually uh, see some cooperation there as well. And finally, because this time uh, when we were discussing uh, things with uh, IMF at that time, it was emphasized by the other side, by the fund, uh, that Pakistan needs to actually uh, bring in the climate change concerns within its uh, purview of its uh, fiscal policy. So that is also going to be very important because PM is also going to uh, attend the opening session of COP28. Mm. And there they, they are going to discuss uh, a lot of things. He's going to speak there as well. So uh, we know that we are going to have a lot of uh, you know developments there. And let's hope in coming days it mm. adds to our uh, economic, financial, and climate uh, stability. Right, absolutely. Let us also welcome in the debate Dr. Agnes Abzal, who's a senior economist and he's joined us on telephone line. Thank you for, uh, very much, Dr. Agnes, for being part of the discussion. Uh, but I'm, I'm going to start with you, um, Dr. Jamil, in, in terms of what, it, what is happening and, and what Farooq talked about and, and the number of engagements and sectors that are involved um, and the, the countries that we're looking at, of course, the, the current scenario um, of economic affairs within the country and the way that we want to, of course, uh, benefit from our relationships with these countries is essential at the moment. But I want you to your take also in terms of the kind of diplomatic relationships that exist between these countries and Pakistan um, and how we can actually capitalize on that and what sort of advantages do you think then exist in terms of moving forward? What should be um, how we need to approach uh, the leadership of these countries? How do we go ahead and pitch uh, the, the business community there and attract more investment within the country? What, in your opinion, um, are, are those diplomatic uh, measures or variables involved uh, that we need to be mindful of? Uh, well, we've been always having a very good diplomatic relations with the UAE. And uh, Pakistan was the first uh, country to recognize UAE. Back in 71, Pakistan, um, uh, and then once uh, in 76, we established our embassy also. Um, Pakistan has always been playing a very significant role um, in the evolution of their defense uh, um, and, 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 uh, and also in their banking sector. Um, so far as the diplomatic uh, front is concerned, at most of the forums uh, around the world, Pakistan and UAE have been supporting each other. Um, and UAE people-to-people -people relation ever from the time of his Highness Sheikh uh, Zayed bin Sultan al-Nihan, the father of the pres uh, present, uh, president, uh, Sheikh uh, Mohammed bin Zayed, um, they had a very sp special uh, uh, feeling for Pakistan and the Pakistani people. The only thing is that uh, to what extent we were able to transform that and then continue, uh, could continue our uh, relations in the upward trajectory diplomatically, yes, military diplomacy, yes, but in trade and commerce, there's so much of room still. And this very visit of the prime minister is going to uh, be very, again, uh, I think landmark visit because uh, the chief of army staff is also accompanying and I know from my personal knowledge, I've been meeting all, all the uh, rulers uh, in UAE, including the His Highness uh, Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed, not once so many times during my tenure in UAE. So I know it for sure that the military diplomacy on with the civilian, the civil uh, efforts, the prime minister efforts, and followed by a joint ministerial committee, uh, which means the diplomatic uh, stream of following whatever agreement, as uh, Mr. Patapi just mentioned, about uh, uh, energy sector, about uh, one more thing which um, uh, they are going to probably pursue, and it is an outstanding um, uh, matter 
which needs to be settled with UAE. And UAE has its own point. If you are able to address it, that is it's a lot the remaining 800 million, which has yet not been paid to Pakistan. There is a whole story behind it, I guess. That point would also be addressed. Uh, but there is one, one um, bottleneck in that. And uh, the agreement which uh, we had with that Salat, that has some loopholes which have not been able to be plugged in by Pakistan so far. But I guess that would also be discussed. But coming back to the outcome of this visit of the Prime Minister, as I said, the diplomatic relation is uh, top, top on the line and we don't have any issue with the diplomatic relations. But the trade and commerce, I think, as I said, that uh, this very visit, after signing in uh, the, the MOUs and the agreement, uh, which has the volume of, uh, can go to the churn of $20 billion subsequently. So that is going to be a very significant landmark. And agriculture uh, it was one thing which uh, was discussed many a time during my time uh, also. And textile, marble, tile, uh, gypsum, uh, uh, gypsum um, the mining, as a matter of fact, and also uh, uh, some of the uh, pro products, which uh, the, the garment products. The area which needs to be tapped, and somehow we've not been able to um, produce the proper slaughterhouse. Um, UAE, we pursued the, uh, the, the authorities there, and they came inspected some of the slaughtered house, uh, which needed a little improvement. And if we do that a little more, Australia uh, exports to the Gulf countries more than about uh, 30 million tons of the halal meat. And Pakistan being so close, the freight is so low, um, uh, it, can, it, it can just be delivered to the ferries also. So these are those um, areas um, uh, which, which, which could be tapped in and uh, uh, that could really okay. uh, create a room for a volume, improving the volume. Because at this time, UAE is the third largest country in terms of our trade. Um, right. And uh, But the balance of trade because of the petroleum, it is uh, in favor of UAE. But all these points which we just discussed, um, if, if we are able to improve a little bit, including vegetables and fruits, um, uh, I think that could be, and then some of the agreements probably would address this point. Uh, the MOUs and the agreement would also address uh, uh, this point. The most important last point is that uh, the human resource. Our human resource, uh, 1.8 billion uh, million people living there and contributing more than five billion dollars uh, per annum uh, remittance to the Pakistan, which is a huge thing. And uh, we've been trying always. The only problem right. and the handicap which we've been facing was that the vocational training schools do not uh, produce the certified, um, the world certified um, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the graduates. And there is so much of demand. They've been giving us those demands and we were not able to fulfill. I think this visit again would really um, smooth in that way uh, so that we are able to produce the required quality of the human resource and provide right. it to them. They definitely, they always right, like Right, absolutely. That. And Dr. Jameel, the, the aspect of human resource is important <laughs> because that's, of course, um, a, one of the factors that we see a lot of interest in. But I want to explore further the economic impact that, that you have mentioned in a number of areas. And Dr. Agnes, I'll, I'll take your perspective and as well, especially in terms of when we talk about the various factors involved um, in the relationship dynamic of these countries and Pakistan. Um, I understand that there are so many things that are going on um, um, that we, we wish to capitalize on. But at the same time, I want to understand, especially um, uh, given aspects of uh, investment within the country, attracting the business community and bringing in um, investment in Pakistan, uh, what exactly then um, needs uh, the, our financial team needs to be equipped with um, or or the caretaker setup or um, whatever aspect that we're bringing into another country um, uh, needs to be um, prepared for in terms of actually making that happen. Um, is it through SIFC that we'll be able to do that? Uh, will the PM's um, uh, leadership um, and meetings with different counterparts enable this, this momentum to, to kick off? Um, how exactly are we going to be approaching um, uh, these countries and, and bringing in investment in the country and what, what then needs to be done on our own side? 
to make it happen. Thank you very much, Sana, for taking me on the show. I'm very happy to be on the show once again. I think Likewise. the number one determinant of uh, attracting investment for a country like Pakistan has to be um, the environment of certainty that can be guaranteed to any potential would-be investor. And one of the reasons that countries like Pakistan, you know, even other countries like Pakistan, uh, do not have stellar rates of investment um, as a percentage of GDP has to do with the overall political instability or environment of uncertainty. So uh, one example of that is, I mean, uh, the recent um, bullish trend on the Pakistan Stock Exchange. I mean, this is the very same stock exchange uh, that uh, was in the doldrums for about five to six years, primarily because of political instability. And once the political instability has dissipated, once a modicum of certainty has returned to the Pakistani political system, uh, you can see um, the bullish trend. Uh, it's almost crossing a um, historic milestone of 16,000. It almost happened today, and inshallah, it will happen in the days to come. So I think that has to be the number one determinant. Now, what can the government do about it? I think the government has to... Um, make use of very effective communication. I mean, they have to communicate the plan uh, for a peaceful, impartial, transparent transfer of power to the next democratically elected government. A uh, plan to hold national elections has already been communicated by the Election Commission of Pakistan. And I think um, watchers outside of Pakistan are looking at this transition to a democratically elected uh, the next democratically elected government very, very closely. And I think we must follow the schedule that has been laid down by the election commission of Pakistan. So I think that has to be the number one task in my mind uh, that this administration can do in order to keep attracting more and more investment in Pakistan. Right, absolutely. And that's a very important factor. And Faisal, I, I want to discuss this further because um, I understand that um, everybody uh, wants to go ahead and, and partner or work with, with, with a stable country and a stable government and everything to be in place. And um, when we talked about the standby arrangement previously as well, we talked about how um, uh, this is going to be part of the caretaker setup and the country is going to be um, uh, taking a look at how exactly they're going to uh, put all their resources and make sure it's successful and then also ensure continuity, especially with SIFC. We also talked about similar models in terms of how to ensure that this actually does happen and the kind of political implications that, that the economic side can have are minimized, um, if not eliminated. So um, when we take a, take a look at where we stand today and how um, elections are just um, uh, on the horizon, what exactly then um, will that, how exactly will then that confidence come in in terms of um, the, the caretaker PM going to these countries right now, visiting and meeting uh, his counterparts, um, engaging with them in different areas of cooperation and trying to bring in investment. <coughs> Um, while we know that in a couple of months there's going to be a change in government. So what will be the perspective of these countries then when they're partnering or talking to uh, the, the current leadership, um, given the fact that they know what lies ahead, will this then be a time period that they're going to try and mull over? Or do you think that we can, we can see something quicker than that actually materializing? So now, when it comes to you know Gulf states, especially uh, uh, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, UAE, uh, Qatar, all of these countries, they have a very, uh, uh, you know, very strong bond with Pakistan. They consider Pakistan as the second home. Why I say this? If we just take the example of, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, UAE. I mean, earlier Ambassador Jamil he rightly uh, put it uh, uh, out there that, uh, of course, uh, uh, Pakistan was the first country that recognized UAE. And at the same time, I just want to highlight one more example. We always see that all of the flights of uh, Emirates Airlines. They start with EK. You know, EK means Emirates from uh, from Emirates to Karachi. And very first pilots who uh, flown that plane, which was originally basically PIA's plane, which was painted with, uh, of course, uh, uh, you know, Emirates. And the pilots were uh, Pakistani pilots as well. And the first flight 
took place. It was from Emirates to Karachi. That is why it's always EK. And still, I mean, it is EK. And, uh, uh, you know, long time ago, and still there are, uh, many of the Emirates, uh, Emirati, uh, uh, you know, people, they used to have their extra houses to go to in Karachi. And still they have, and I have uh, obviously seen quite a few of them uh, still there, and uh, they still visit. So the relationship with them, it is not about the certain government, it is not about the interim setup, it is not about, uh, you know, PMLN's government or PTI's government, it is about people-to-people -people relationship. It is about uh, the brotherly bond which we have, and I think uh, uh, it, is, uh, it is always good that whoever is ruling in Pakistan, it's an interim setup or uh, PTI or PMLN or People's Party, whoever is ruling, I mean, they're going there, uh, in uh, in Emirates or any of the Gulf states, it has significance. Why I say this? Because at this hour, of course, uh, as we know that uh, Middle East is going through a lot, and at this hour, uh, Pakistan's Prime Minister, interim Prime Minister being there, it's a huge importance, huge significance of it, and having multiple visits of uh, a club visit of uh, the Emirates, it's, it's always uh, significant uh, for Pakistan and them countries as well at the same time. Uh, earlier, uh, Dr. Jamil highlighted one thing, and that was related to, of course, uh, uh, you know, all of these uh, uh, Middle Eastern countries. They import uh, meat and uh, livestock from Australia. Uh, Pakistan has huge uh, sort of, uh, you know, opportunity, and at the same time, Pakistan can do it. Last year, when I visited uh, Baluchistan, majority of the people whom I talked with, they were obviously, uh, you know, uh, attached to somehow with the livestock uh, business, and that, that livestock business can be increased in Pakistan. Them people, of course, they can uh, obviously have uh, livestock related to camels, sheep, you name it, and they can do it. And Pakistan has an opportunity uh, in this uh, context. And at the same time, you know, UAE is one of the countries where uh, Pakistan shares a bilateral trade of $10 billion, and of course 1.6 million who are living there, they are, uh, uh, you know, sending a huge chunk, almost $6 billion a year, they send uh, in shape of remittances in Pakistan, and I think uh, that should be increased, and somehow, of course, the interim prime minister, he will try his level best to, of course, increase it. And when we talk about the IT sector, of course, Pakistan's IT sector, uh, I mean, uh, Pakistan's graduates, they are accepted uh, throughout the world, in the Western world, of, and uh, in the Middle Eastern world as well. That needs to be increased. And uh, when we talk about the IT sector, of course, there are companies which are based in Pakistan uh, related to IT sector, they have to uh, have more contracts from, uh, uh, you know, Middle Eastern countries. And of course, when it comes to cyber security, artificial intelligence, all of these sectors, Pakistan is already enhancing itself. And I think it's a, it's a win-win situation for both right. of the brotherly, uh, brotherly countries that they can increase, uh, you know, IT right, trade but, as but, well. But, but Faisal, my question remains still mm. in terms of how exactly um, will the, the factor that we have elections Mm. coming in in a couple of months factor in what we're looking at today mm. you know looking at looking at of course uh, uh, you know election is coming up like i said earlier uh, election or no election it doesn't matter at all of course uh, you know the middle eastern countries the gulf states they have always been having great relationship with pakistan uh, as a second home but right. at the same time yes election have uh, an importance and yes them countries they are looking at it keenly how the things move on and uh, i mean we have uh, you know seen in the past i mean they never had any hindrances in terms of who was ruling in pakistan and whoever has been ruling in pakistan there was there was no hindrances at all so i believe uh, you know election won't be a factor that can uh, you know deter some kind of relationship between both of the countries Right, um, and <laughs> we're going to be moving on uh, with what you've actually said because, um, Paroch, uh, with reference to uh, it, uh, the, the, the spirit of conversation that sometimes uh, Faisal gets swayed in, he's <laughs> talked about how elections are no elections, it's not <laughs> important, but I'm sure that's not what he meant. But yeah. um, 
how we how we take a look at at uh, what's going on internally, especially in terms of the political dynamics at the moment, um, and then with the leadership uh, moving on um, with its counterparts in different countries. Um, I, I still uh, want to gauge then, given the different political leaderships and decision makers and different parties and dynamics that 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 are changing right now. Um, uh, wouldn't this be uh, um, uh, something that that different leaders um, are already? looking at and, and uh, sort of analyzing and figuring out and how exactly what sort of direction the country is going to take, whether or not there's going to be continuity in policies, whether or not there is going to be assurances in terms of different um, areas that they're going to be looking at, while at the same time we have a caretaker set up that's meeting and engaging with them. And then also previously the military leadership coming in with the SIFC as well. Yeah. So how exactly will these different factors be collaborated or looked at um, in terms of one country mm -hmm. presenting its investment? A capital or opportunity. Well, right, uh, Sana. I think that uh, when you actually were uh, talking about Faisal, I think you cut him a lot of slack. <laughs> I think he uh, genuinely meant okay. what he said. Right. Election or no election, <laughs> it doesn't matter, right? To him yeah. at least. Uh, it doesn't matter to me either because <laughs> I'm not going to vote no matter even if you offer angels as the candidates. But that is my choice. Uh, regarding stability of in, uh, uh, political climate for investment, I can sh sh tell you two or three things which are very important. One of the reasons why SIFC is there uh, is to ensure that uh, Pakistan, uh, any investor in Pakistan uh, doesn't have to go through too many windows and mm -hmm. is not grifted by petty bureaucracies, right? Uh, at local level, grassroots level, we have heard that there are many problems or obstacles that uh, that uh, occupy uh, a lot of time of the investor. So that was the uh, first thing that was important about SIFC. Faisal spoke about agriculture, including uh, livestock uh, and uh, you know meat production. I think that uh, that is an important component of SIFC. And because Army is invested in the whole uh, concept or idea, I think that uh, at least one aspect is guaranteed, that whosoever the next government is, we can have some qualitative, uh, qualitative assurance mm -hmm. of stability of policies. Now, when you talk about Pakistan and uh, for that matter, UAE cooperation, there are three parts. Sana. One is Pakistan. The other one is UAE, whatever happens in UAE. And the third part is the relationship between the two countries. I think that there are lessons that we have, we still need to learn, and I think that only um, a very little bit of homework on our leadership's part in the past yeah. would have solved many things. For example, I think that when Yemen war was actually taking place at that time, uh, taking it to uh, you know parliament and then open mic situation and parliament actually antagonized a lot of people, mm -hmm. right? That was a mistake that we actually, and I, by the way, bring it up because we are uh, hell-bent on actually winning back whosoever were we had estranged at that time, and we will do it, inshallah. Now, the second aspect is uh, uh, Imran Khan's own uh, time, and at that time, his foibles, uh, so to speak. There is certain mannerism involved whenever you go to any court, right? So uh, I think that there, there has to be certain understanding. If the foreign office does its job, if uh, uh, rest of bureaucracy does it top, uh, uh, its job uh, in uh, prepping the prime ministers and presidents that go to uh, these countries, then I think that all these matters will be fixed. We assure policy stability in Pakistan. We are, uh, we are convinced that this relationship between Pakistan and UAE, Pakistan and Saudi Arabia, Pakistan and Kuwait, these things are going to be stable and uh, these are very important, precious relationships and they are going to be strengthened in coming days. Finally, Sana, uh, Faisal brought up a very interesting aspect and that is our, uh, you know, labor that is working in UAE mm. for that matter. And then, of course, but the rest of Arab countries, too. Uh, one has to appreciate how quickly the market is changing. Yeah. We used to send people who were merely trained and baseline jobs and all that, and that was okay uh, for a time. 
now for example ue uh, abu dhabi dubai are really uh, very dynamically transforming their market auto automating and bringing in any every kind of expensive technology similarly in saudi arabia noim uh, the the city that has been built that is amazing as well and that also involves a lot of job that can be created but that is going to be smart job so what we need to do is uh, sit down with our arab uh, you know partners and ask them what kind of uh, you know job uh, labor do you need and then uh, come back and double down on creating institutions that actually churn out similar kind of people Excellent. and i i think that that can be done mm -hmm. and if that is done this number is nothing we can double triple uh, quadruple these numbers Excellent. right absolutely um dr agdas uh, another aspect with regards to um uh, particularly this visit and engagement with with uh, uh, with foreign players in terms of our uh the economic indicators within pakistan uh, is important in terms of the continuity of policy and also in terms of the one window solution uh, that farooq was talking about uh, the sifc that w was brought forward to ensure that we do have a place where we can attract more investment coming in and while there have been certain announcements that are welcoming um i want to also understand then so far if we look at since the establishment of of the body till now um how beneficial do you think it has been in terms of bringing in investment and also in terms of complementing the existing infrastructures including the financial teams of the ministry um and the current leadership um in actually accomplishing similar goals okay so first um i would just like to um how should i say endorse what uh, farooq sahab just said about the, the changing nature of jobs in the greater middle east and i think he couldn't be more right when he talks about this massive um smart transformation uh, digital revolution of sorts that is going on in the middle east and i think it is a very very important point that he has made and i would really like to see uh, pakistani pakistani policy makers making note of what Dr. Saab has said that you know we need to really sit down and talk out the kind of labor that we want to export to this region because um uh these countries these societies are going through a massive massive uh, transformation so having said that i will now come back to the questions that you uh, put before me and i think the role that the SIFC has played in my opinion has been a very positive one now why do i say this? i think one of the one of the strengths of the pakistani uh, system so to speak is the ability of our civil and military institutions um uh, they both have this ability to come together whenever pakistan is facing a crisis and we have seen this happening during covid-19 with the establishment of ncot that was a successful um example of the two types of institutions coming together and mind you why did sifc um come about in the first place sifc basically came about because pakistan political system was going through a very volatile period a lot of instability uh, so to speak and in that environment the biggest casualty was pakistan's economy because of the uncertainty because of the anxiety and because of the volatility uh pakistan was on the verge of pakistan's economy was on the verge of default and so uh, many of our foreign partners the foreign would be investors demanded that uh, you know the word that uh, again for us uh, for qualified assurances and i think one of the biggest um input from the sifc has been in getting a dose of certainty to pakistan um Pakistani system and i think so in that sense it has been a very very important addition um to the pakistani economy and some of the steps that they have taken since then for instance in terms of implementation helping the administration in implementing uh taking very strong steps in curtailing smuggling of foreign goods i think uh, the overall uh steps that have been taken by the sifc have been very positive and I uh, would certainly like to see um you know uh, that SIFC has an extended role in stabilizing Pakistan's economy um in the months to come I mean maybe not forever but definitely mm. during the transition period from a caretaker setup 
to the new democratically elected government so that Pakistani economy can maintain this momentum and keep making progress towards stability and growth. <laughs> Right. Um, uh, Dr. Jamil, um, given then the, the, the scenario where, where we see um, uh, how different bodies and teams have interacted, um, especially in terms of economic matters within the country, it was extremely important regarding the IMF as well um, as to how exactly we're going to move forward um, with the deal. And we were very happy to have the standby arrangement. And then, of course, there were questions of how it's going to be, uh, how it's going to progress, who's going to lead it, and um, a number of aspects with reference to a certain people who are, who are leading the financial uh, ministry as, as to what sort of impact they have created or not. And then, of course, with, with people in the SIFC and then the current teams as well in the leadership. And I understand while bodies or systems or infrastructures need to be important and equipped enough to be able to strengthen um, uh, the, the process and, and to get things done, how then um, will you see um, the value that certain individuals have brought to the table so far um, in the current uh, government and, and uh, within the FSIFC as well. And then also then how that sort of leadership change, um, uh, if we see after the elections, um, will impact the, the current progress or sin the different trajectory that we see as part of the SIFC and then also as part of um, our relations with other countries and our deals with other countries. Um, how will the individual teams who are interacting or collaborating um, with individuals on the other side as well um, enable this process to continue? Well, there's a complete <coughs> framework. As a matter of fact, uh, if there is an agreement between the two states, two countries, it's the agreement between the state, not between the uh, uh, individuals who are heading right. the state at that time. Right, I, I so, understand that. I understand right. that, but still, and we've that. seen the the impact that 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 different leaders or individuals have brought to the table in terms of negotiations, in terms of impact throughout um, actually making things um, uh, materialize, in terms of of deals actually moving forward, in terms of trust deficits, and so many other things that may actually still uh, impact the system or framework or agreement that may already been be achieved. Uh, that's right. Uh, we already have that framework, and that's known as. Uh, the, the Joint Ministerial Committee, GMC. Basically, the, we, we keep having those meetings from various countries, and every two years we have to have that meeting with the UAE as well. And uh, the, the, that is the platform where we evaluate all the MOUs, we evaluate all the agreements, and then we find out where are the uh, short, shortfalls and how it could be plugged in. So that is one framework. The second, leadership definitely matters. Who is negotiating, that, that definitely matters. And that's how, that, that's why these agreements are important once it's adopted and once it's signed. Because both the parties and both countries have to really agree to certain clauses. For example, if I give you a specific example of our agreement, PTCL, et Salah, at that time, whatever we agree, there was certain clause. Um, I still remember the paragraph of the clause which uh, the Prime Minister of that time, Shokat Azizi, had changed it with his own hand. We had to follow it, although it did not suit us. And I just mentioned about $800 million, which is still, um, uh, which uh, UAE owes to us. But then we also have to really um, fulfill certain obligations before getting those $800 million. Uh, the dollars. So uh, the, coming back on that point of uh, uh, the agreement and then followed by materializing those agreements and the MOUs. So uh, that is to be followed by the foreign office and by once it is followed by the foreign office, all the ministries uh, of the country, they support foreign office and they, are, they have their presence in the JGMC. So that's how it is implemented. But this time, as uh, the other panelists were also discussing, it's the, uh, the the special investment facilitation cell. Once I was posted there, not one, rather three rulers of UAE uh, uh, would, uh, uh, would in fact raise this observation that their country people, they go for the investment in Pakistan and they, they really meet with so many hurdles, 24 uh, different departments and they have to really approach them and they have to get all these approval and so on. But now because of this one platform, it would become much more easier for those investors to come and invest in Pakistan. That was one bottleneck. You know, what, what basically has happened with our 
this uh, um, beautiful country is that we've not been able to upgrade some of the policies, rules, regulations, and we are following that because of which there are so many hurdles for the, uh, right. there were so many hurdles for the investor, investors. And I, 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 I used to normally sum up with one line that we cannot meet the challenges of 21st century with the tools of 19th century. So this bridging mechanism of SIFC would address that problem. And then they, the, the Gulf countries, even the China would not really mind uh, uh, okay. any leadership, uh, forthcoming leadership. They would go by the agreement and uh, MOU. And right. I'm sure that this plan. This right, absolutely. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jameel Evan Khan, for joining us. And thank you very much, Dr. Agnes Abzal, for joining us. Unfortunately, that's all that we have time for, but thank you for giving your input. We're going to also going, uh, going to look at uh, what has happened in KP and, and the increase in terrorist activities in the province um, with the attack um, in Bannu, um, in which we know uh, that at least uh, three uh, army personnel uh, have been martyred, including two civilians and many others that have been injured. Um, and Faisal, of course, this is in line with a series of attacks that we've seen in the past. Unfortunately, um, a lot of that, um, uh, the, the brunt of it is seen by provinces uh, KP and Balochistan. And at the same time, now given the current scenario, it seems that it's even more uh, important um, uh, for the security personnel to move ahead with a strategy in place. What exactly do you think um, is different this time around, given the dynamics of, of uh, the kind um, uh, of decision taken with regards to illegal uh, immigrants within the country and um, illegal Afghan nationals um, residing within Pakistan. And then, of course, also uh, the, the aspect of this particular attack also linking to an Afghan national. Yes, Sana, while we're talking, of course, uh, you know, 1.7 in total, 1.7 million uh, Afghan nationals who, who's been uh, not registered in Pakistan, they were living in uh, uh, illegally in Pakistan. I mean, out of them, 400,000, they have already been deterred to go back on their own. And of course, they have uh, left the country and they go, they, they've uh, gone back. Uh, here about the suicide attack, the certain the, the suicide attack that took place uh, in Bannu today, it is the second of this year in yeah. Bannu and uh, once once again motorcycle is used and of course it, it was being ridden by uh, one of the illegal uh, Afghan nationals. Uh, this time around uh, the person uh, in question was actually uh, you know attached with the Gul Bahadur group. Gul Bahadur group is affiliated with, uh, of course, from Afghanistan, affiliated with the uh, uh, sitting Taliban regime. And uh, at the same time, it has very good relations with the TTP as well. So lately, TTP has been ut utilizing all of these, uh, you know, tiny groups, uh, uh, miscreants, and they have been uh, utilizing their services in Pakistan through the, with the help of uh, illegal uh, Afghan nationals who've been residing in Pakistan and there have been 16 of these incidents that took place this year alone. Uh, I just wanted to highlight here if 16 has been able to you know succeed in carrying out their activity at the same time I'm pretty much sure because our uh, you know intelligence agencies security agencies are working day and night to of course uh, you know eliminate all of these uh, threats uh, which are uh, reaching out to Pakistan, I am pretty much sure that 100 times more than these uh, attacks uh, that were obviously uncovered by our security agencies and intelligent, uh, intelligence agencies and they have been countered before, it, before they took place. So here is, uh, you know, 400,000, they have already been deterred to go back. Of course, door-to-door -door searches are carried, uh, carried out in Pakistan. Uh, especially in the larger cities of Pakistan where uh, majority of these were residing and very soon we will be knowing that uh, uh, you know majority of these uh, illegal ones they have gone back see the illegal Af Afghan immigrants it is quite easier for them to do these kind of activities because they are sort of uh, already you know brainwashed by uh, their certain groups and of course they get uh, huge amounts for that as well their families they get amounts for that and of course TTP is uh, very effectively using them against uh, Pakistan so here uh, I mean uh, I think government needs to push uh, this uh, policy further uh, you know uh, yeah. down so that the 
the remaining illegal Afghan nationals, they can be sent home so that the threat of uh, unregistered people carrying out these kind of activities in Pakistan. I understand what you're saying, but, but very quick, quickly, Farouk, do you think that that actually will deal with the essence of the problem here? Um, uh, we, we've had such a major decision <coughs> that, that we took, um, but is it is it helping in the situation on ground or is it anything else that, that needs to be added with our strategy? Right, uh, Sana, very quickly, uh, since uh, uh, Faisal has spoken about uh, Afghan illegal immigrants or residents, then one has to actually, and uh, it is very difficult for me to say, but uh, one cannot actually uh, ignore all the nuances, particularly yeah. because when he was talking about Taliban then, uh, or TTP, then he ended up actually focusing on nuances, right? Mm -hmm. Will Bahadur grow up and all, right? Uh, my humble submission is, while these elements might be involved, we cannot overlook our domestic extremism problem. For example, TTP's uh, leaders, are they from Afghanistan or Pakistan? Mm -hmm. uh, Gul Bahadur group is named after an Afghan national or Pakistani national, yeah. right? Uh, the, so the biggest question right now, and I hope, I wish I, we were actually discussing that bit, is that when these uh, suicide attack has come, who actually rigs the bomb or jacket uh, for them to actually carry? Where exactly are these factories or these places where they can actually get all these uh, makeshift arrangements? Mm. So we have to actually smoke all these elements out as well. Yeah. Mm. Uh, and I think that while um, uh, illegal immigrant uh, issue is serious and we have to actually keep on dealing with it, but uh, uh, putting everything on one policy and thinking that it is somehow going to make things hunky dory right. will not work. Right, absolutely, and that's an extremely valid point. Thank you, Farrell. Thank you, uh, Faisal, for joining us and being part of the debate. And of course, we hope that as we progress ahead, we're able to take uh, all the many issues that we're currently facing together um, and uh, put Pakistan on the right path and deal with not just our economic problems, but our security challenges at home as well. That's all that we have from the debate. We'll now see you tomorrow.